We've been in a series that we've titled, come on, say it with me, Momentum. 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 We're, we're growing in momentum. We're thinking about momentum. Hopefully, you're here today and you're just challenged by the idea of forward motion. If we were to define that phrase, momentum, we would define it forward motion. We took a bunch of different definitions and collaborated them together. What could be a catchable, memorable way to define momentum? It's to have forward motion. And I was thinking I would hear at least two amens on that from people that aren't going backwards, but people that are going forward. Amen? I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that uh, we don't have to live in the past. I'm grateful that Jesus saves us from our past. And I'm grateful that he moves us in a direction that is forward. We celebrated our seven-year birthday at Walk Church recently, and uh, that was the word God put on my heart for this next season, is to have forward motion together as a church. We talked about how to have forward motion when it comes to family, family momentum. In fact, Join the Family Session 1 is starting right now. Um, It's going to continue. Next week is Session 2. Make plans to be there if you want to join the Walk Church family. We encourage everybody to go to the three steps of what it means to become family here at Walk Church on the first, second, and third Sunday of every uh, month. And come on, somebody say Happy November. Happy (laughs) November. You made it to a new month, praise God. You know, we're, we're here. We're excited about that. And we are leaning into this subject of momentum in the past few weeks, we've talked about leadership momentum. So not just being a part of a church family, but being a leader within that church family is a big deal for us. We want to encourage every family member to grow in their leadership here at Walk Church. We define leadership with this acronym, LEAD, L-E-A-D. L stands for learners. Leaders are learners. We're on this lifelong journey of learning as we follow Christ. Uh, the E stands for excellent, right? The leaders are striving for excellence because God is worthy of our excellence. Daniel had an excellent spirit, and the Lord honored that on his life. In Daniel 6, you can read about it. The A stands for aware. Great leaders have great self-awareness. Great leaders ask great questions so that they can be better aware. Uh, And finally, the D stands for disciplined. Uh, Leaders are disciplined. You can catch up on any of those sermons on walkchurch.com. Click on the sermon button and you'll, you'll be there, or you can check out our Walk Church app and find those sermons there. Well, today what I want to do is I want to take a quick break in some of what we've been leaning into when it comes to family and leadership, and where we're going is kingdom momentum, but because it's the first Sunday in the month of November, I want to talk about a subject here today that we give treatment to every first Sunday of the month, and that's the topic of communion, the topic of the Lord's Supper. Typically, what we do here at Walk Church is On the first Sunday of the month, that's our rhythm, that's our pattern, is one of our pastors or one of our leaders or somebody within our church will give a devotion uh, on the subject of communion, on what it is and what it isn't, so that as we partake in this beautiful subject, uh, we do it rightly. But today I really felt a burden on my heart to lean in a little bit longer in this sermon right here. I want to preach a message to you today that I'm titling, The Blood Has Momentum. The blood has momentum. I felt like I was strong on this side of the room, but this side of the room was still kind of echoed over. The blood has momentum. I don't tend to hear enough uh, content in our Christianity on the topic of the blood. And I'm aware that the blood of Jesus can be a unpopular subject to discuss, Um, or it could be a little bit ambiguous. It may not exactly make full sense, but what I want to do is look at a passage of Scripture, in fact, several passages of Scripture that my prayer would be that could help us understand the blood better and actually see the forward motion that follows the blood of Jesus. So if you're ready, say ready. Ready. Come on, if you're hungry, say let's eat. Let's eat. eat. Father, ooh, we are ready to eat today. We came uh, with a good appetite for the word Uh, God, I pray you would stir us today as we look at your word, read your word. Oh, speak to us, God. Uh, Open and transform our minds. Renew us. Give us renewal. And God, thank you for your blood. Help us to uh, draw near to you today because of your blood. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you have a copy of God's word, I want to invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 22. So we're going to camp out for a few minutes. Luke chapter 22. We're going to look at the Last Supper discourse in these few verses. 
Uh, when you get there, say, I'm there. If you need more time, say, hold up. Okay, we're going to hold up for you. No problem. Take your time. Take your time. If you need a copy of God's Word, just put your hand in the air, and we would love to walk you one down. we got some really nice hardback ESV Bibles, which is one I'm using here today. So if you need a Bible, uh, let us bless you with one. We'd be honored to do that. we got a few hands up. Feel free to walk them down a Bible, please. Thank you. Uh, Luke chapter 22. If you're there, say, I'm there. All right, we're starting in verse 14. We're going to go all the way to verse 20. So we're reading a chunk of scripture here today, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to try your best to use your imagination, and I want you to go to the upper room with Jesus. Can you do that? Yeah. You ever see those paintings where, you know, it's like Jesus is there at the center of the table, and you, all the homies are like leaning on him? Can you just put yourself in there? You could be like the 13th disciple. Yeah. Just, just lean in and listen to what Jesus has to say, because the wisdom that he unpacks here in Luke 22 is profound. Let's look at it together. It says, when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Verse 17, and he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 20, and likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my life. Blood. I want to just go ahead and highlight uh, this phrase, new covenant, for a second. Can everybody just say that with me? Just say new covenant. Come on, say it with me one more time. Say new covenant. I'm going to grab one of these packets right here because I want to talk about the significance, the value, and the momentum that is in my hand right now. What this represents matters. It represents, come on, a new covenant. Jesus does quite a few things in Luke chapter 22. If you look back at verse 14, we'll just pop over uh, uh, to that slide just for a moment. He says, when the hour came, he reclined at table with the apostles with them. And here's what he said. Now lean into Jesus's words here. Note takers, check this out. He says, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. This verse right here is, it's so powerful but yet so packaged in there, if you're not careful, you could just drive by it and miss the significance. Jesus is demonstrating his affection. Jesus is telling us about his emotion. Jesus is telling us about his desires. Jesus is telling us about all that went into this moment for it to be so special. And I think if, we, if we're not careful, this can just be another Sunday. But Jesus did not want this to just be another Sunday. I've been watching this documentary uh, on Netflix. It's called The Redeem Team. I don't know if you got a chance to see it. If you're a basketball fan or if you're a Kobe fan like me, it was, it was deep. In fact, I was finishing it yesterday and Nina came down the stairs and I almost was like, go back up. Go back up. It's maybe a tear. It's maybe allergies. I don't know. Um, but it was just so moving to me um, just watching that. And it's, it's really just highlighting this journey from the NBA or the, actually the USA Olympic basketball team that lost in 2004 is now making their way to redemption in 2008 and just telling that story in a really profound way. But what was neat is as I was watching it, there's this moment where the Olympic team in 2008 finally makes it to the championship game uh, where they play Spain, who had beat them in the previous years. And it was neat as they introduced, um, interviewed all the different players on the team, they were saying, we were finally there. We had worked for the last four years to get to this game. We had practiced, we had lost the four years previous, and then we just could not stop thinking about getting back to the gold. We had, we had traveled the world, we had did practices all over the place, we had had all these pep talks and all of these moments, but finally, it's now here. We are there ready for the game and we're not gonna miss the moment. Why do I show that? I think this is that moment for Jesus. I think Jesus, born of a virgin, Praise God. Is anybody getting excited about Christmas time? 
I mean, no shade to Thanksgiving, but I'm already getting red and green, all right? I'm already getting pumped up. I'm getting closer and closer to Christmas music on, full blast. I love this season. I love the birth of Jesus. I love the narrative of the Christmas story. Mary and Joseph, the wise men, the angels, the animals. It's such a powerful thing. But let me just tell you, the reason for the season is not just Christmas. The reason for the season is the blood that Jesus holds. If you just stop at Christmas, you miss the purpose. Christmas happens, and then Jesus takes 30 years in his messianic uh, walk with his his family. He's he's not really going full public in his messianic ministry yet. I don't know all the reasons why Jesus waited till he was 30. Maybe he was just modeling great things take time. I just want to tell you that. Don't just think stuff is going to happen overnight. Right? It's too often we're thinking in days and weeks. We need to be thinking in decades. We need to be thinking, how is this going to translate in my life for the rest of my life? Jesus was modeling. Leadership takes time. Not that Jesus wasn't always who he says he was. I mean, you can find the, the wise men laying down their gifts at the altar of the, the manger. <laughs> he always was, but I think he's demonstrating. You know, it takes time. But at age 30, right, Jesus begins to go public with his messianic ministry, and he does all types of action, right? He, he's in Samaria. He ministers to the woman at the well. He's in the graveyard in Mark chapter 5, ministering to the demon-possessed man. He goes with Jairus to his house to wake up the, the daughter. He's walking on water with Peter. He's raising Lazarus from the dead. He's telling and teaching parables. Somebody's lowering a man in front of Jesus into his house. He's on mission. He's pilgriming up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem, and he goes, I've been waiting for this moment all my life. The night, I wonder if Jesus had this, I've been dreaming about this Passover dinner, that Jesus had it in his affection. He said, oh, oh, you guys, I've been earnestly desiring this moment. Jesus says, this Passover will change history. The disciples were like, all right, Jesus is here. Let's do this Passover dinner. Let's get to it. And Jesus goes, no, no, this is different. I have earnestly desired to get back to this championship moment. (laughs) This is the gold as I take this bread and this cup in my hands. He says, I'm instituting a new covenant. Jump back with me to verse 20. I want you to see it. Don't miss it. Please don't miss it. Likewise, the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. In order to have a new covenant, you have to first have an old covenant. The old covenant is found on display in the left side of your Bibles in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is a beautiful collection of God's words and God's works prior to Christ and his coming in the Christmas story. But Jesus was always there and at work. And I would just encourage you today, if you're ever going to fully understand the New Testament, you have to get well acquainted with the Old Testament. If you're ever going to understand what Jesus is talking about here, and if it's going to hit you and make a difference in your life, friend, I want to encourage you to get an appetite for the OT because it's loaded. And Jesus here is talking about a Passover dinner that if you don't fully understand what he's talking about, this quite doesn't make sense. In fact, it's maybe confusing to you. The Passover is a beautiful story. In fact, it's a history lesson that you can find in the book of Exodus. Can I just give you a trailer? Anybody thankful for trailers? I think sometimes trailers do too much where you're like, man, I think I just watched the whole movie in two minutes. Somebody amen that? So I'm not going to give you the the, the whole movie. You got to read Exodus for yourself, all right? That's a good assignment for you in November. Read Exodus and get to know this story well, but I'll give you the trailer so that we can just be on the same landing page of Jesus in Luke 22. There's this powerful moment where God calls a man named Moses to lead the people of God who were enslaved in Egypt out into freedom. They had prayed. They had called upon the name of the Lord. The the Lord said he heard their prayer and he raised up a man and his relative Aaron as well. And they began to approach Pharaoh and say, let God's people go. Pharaoh, what does he do? He hardens his heart. And so hardened hearts are, it's not a good recipe with God's activity because God will break through that. (laughs) He'll get your attention. 
God begins to get Pharaoh's attention by sending plagues. Plague after plague after plague hits the land. But the final plague, even though Pharaoh had a hard heart, really got his attention. Final plague would feature this really devastating announcement where God the Father announced that on this specific Passover night, every person who believes in him as Lord, believes in him as Savior, believes in him as Redeemer and the one that could set them free, that those people would take the blood of a lamb and they would take that lamb blood and they would spread it across their doorpost. And that night, God the Father would send the angel of death who would then pass through the land looking for who had the blood of the lamb covering their family. And if you had the blood of the lamb covering you by faith, that death would pass over you. But if you did not have the blood of the lamb, that the firstborn child would then pass away. It was a devastating moment. It was a wake-up call for Pharaoh, yet he continued to harden his heart and did not believe. And on that night, anybody who had the blood of the lamb covering them saw that death passed over, but those who did not have that blood resulted in death. And it was destructive. It was devastating. And Pharaoh woke up at that moment and he said, okay, you guys just get out of here. Go. And it's so neat that in that moment, God began to do a crazy, amazing, grace-filled, miraculous work in the people of Israel. And then he, he got them through. He opened up the Red Sea. He moved the people into the promised land, or at least towards that. They had a few little hiccups along the way of wandering and disobedience. And you can read that in the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy and Leviticus and see the story on display in Numbers. But I just want to encourage you with this. God set in place a holiday. He set in place a moment on the calendar where we as people who are fallen and tend to drift and forget things, that we would remember what he did at the Passover. We would remember how he set in place the blood. We would remember how he passed over individuals. We'd remember how he opened up the sea. We remember the journey of God's miraculous hand. And now Jesus is saying here, I was so excited to eat this. I was so excited to celebrate the Passover because I'm celebrating a new Passover that's actually found in my blood. That this blood is not just going to cover the doorpost of your life for this moment. This blood is an eternal blood that's going to lead you all the way to eternity in heaven. This blood, oh, come on, I'll clap with you, sis. This blood right here is a different type of blood. This is the new covenant that's being put into place where the old covenant was more about our works and our duty and the sacrificial system that was put in place to have a temporary essence of forgiveness was actually foreshadowing what Jesus would do as the real Passover lamb that me and you are de deeply in need of. This is what he demonstrates here in Luke 22 as he holds up the cup. He says a new covenant is putting in place. T today, if you celebrate the Passover or not, it's okay. I think it's good to celebrate the Passover. I love when we do the Seder meal here at Walk Church and grateful for our Sunrise Cafe family for hosting us and leading that time. Andrew and Angie, some of the team are here today. We're going to continue to do that. But here's what I'll tell you. Whether or not you celebrate the Passover here today is a conviction that you can hold to, but don't miss the blood of Jesus. Because the new covenant has been put in place by Christ himself and he's demonstrated that through his blood. Oh, look at this verse with me in 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 18. I think this is a helpful reminder when we think about this topic. Here's what Peter says. Now, Peter is a fallen disciple, right? He denied Jesus on the last night of his life earthly before he rose from the grave. Peter was oftentimes saying the wrong thing. Can anybody relate to Peter? Okay, just me. All right. I'm glad I'm with some other friends here. Peter says, you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, let me go ahead and just park on that for a second. Peter says that you might have been given some bad practices from your forefathers. Maybe something was passed down to you that shouldn't have been passed down. Maybe something was done to you. Maybe something was said to you. Maybe something was revealed to you in your past. Well, praise God, Jesus ransoms you from that, rescues you out of that. 
How does he do it? Not with perishable things such as silver or gold. Jesus doesn't show up with a big bag of money. Jesus doesn't show up with a big bag of gifts. Jesus shows up with his precious blood. Come on. But with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. Jesus carries the precious blood. Amen? Here's my fear. With a sermon like this, or even in a rhythm of monthly times of partaking in communion, that the blood loses its preciousness to us. The language of the precious blood is uh, really important. Today we have communion stations on the left and the right, in the front and the back. Listen to me, lean in. Let me see your eyes for a second, even though I can't really see them too well. (laughs) Do not, do not, do not stroll over here. Let me grab one of these because this is what we do. Pop the wafer in, take a sip, go on with my life. This is precious blood by Jesus Christ, paid in full for me and for you. Do not approach the table like a robot. Do not approach the table as it's a religious tradition. This is just what we do. It's not. It's a big deal. It's precious. It's Christ who shed his blood on the tree so that you could be ransomed from your sins that is holding you back, that is entangling you, that would love to steal, kill, and destroy your life. Approach the table with a carefulness. Approach the table with a confidence. Approach the table with a somber excitement for the precious blood. Oh, please. Please don't. This is not a moment of just casual flippancy. This is not a moment to just say, oh yeah, let's kick back and have some communion. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians says that's dangerous. In fact, some people in the Corinthian church were making their way, trying to have, he said, some of y'all are trying to have dinner with the communion elements. That's not what it was for. It's like That's not even a good dinner, by the way. Your purpose was wrong. Some people had even gotten sick. Some people had even passed away from approaching the table with a foolishness, a a not wise approach to the table. Now, I don't want anybody to be fearful when you approach the table. I want you to know what you're doing. And I want you to have a sense of gratitude and a sense of conviction as you approach the communion table today. Amen? Amen. It's a big deal. If you want to have momentum in your walk with Jesus, there's momentum on the blood. The blood has power to ransom. The blood has power to save. This is the, the blood that comes from the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There's a new Passover lamb in place. Come on, can we just be reminded of John the Baptist's words? John is baptizing. He's preparing the way we spotlighted John the Baptist recently about our leadership class. He was a man who had awareness. Well, in John chapter 1, Jesus comes up on the scene and John sees him. And what does John say to his disciples? He says, behold. Come on, right? He saw Jesus coming and he said, hold up. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I love the exclamation point. John the Baptist was hyped. He got pumped up, amen? Amen. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I wonder if they were like, what's gotten into John? They weren't quite aware of what John saw. Jesus says, I've been waiting for this. Jesus would say, I'm going to die and shed my blood so that my people in Las Vegas and those who are watching online and those who are in the room here today would come to a 
knowledge of repentance, turn away from their sins that can't help you anyway, and with forward motion, come to Jesus by faith and say, Jesus, I can't do it in my own works. I can't do it in my own strength, but I can find my confidence in your blood. This is momentum in the blood. John had that. John knew that. This lamb of God is different from the old lambs. I mean, this is the sacrificial system in place, but Jesus is the final and great sacrifice. Look at Leviticus chapter 17. Again, bumping back into the Old Testament, looking into the Levitical law. Verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. This scripture, thousands of years before Jesus would step foot on earth, is a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do, amen? On the cross, in the shedding of his blood, would make a way for us to have new life. I mean, I want you to try to make this real for yourself. Put yourself in a doctor's office and the doctor takes your blood and goes off and comes back 15 minutes later and you sit down in the room and the doctor says, I have some bad news. You need a blood transfusion in order for you to live. And he says, you need it now. And you say, okay, what type of blood do I need? And he says, well, you need blood that is actually really rare. It's holy blood. It's righteous blood. It's sinless blood. It's blood that doesn't come from earth. It comes from heaven. It is blood that is actually only found in God himself. And you can have that blood. It's in Christ. He, he is the lamb of God that we broken sinners in need of a savior run into and find rest. Come on and find healing. Find momentum in the blood, amen? I wanna give you three points. I'm gonna try to make them quick. Three points on how you can find momentum in the blood. Point number one, find momentum in the blood because the blood moves our conscience. I hear some snickering. I don't really know what that means. (laughs) The blood moves our conscience. It's an important point because I think that we don't give enough attention to our conscience. And does anybody ever feel like your mind will play tricks on you? Oh, you feel like your conscience is haunted, your conscience is uh, distorted, or your conscience just doesn't feel like it's right. Let me tell you something. The blood moves our conscience. I love these scriptures found in the book of Hebrews. I love the book of Hebrews. It really marries the Old Testament with the New Testament in such a beautiful and poetic way. Look at Hebrews chapter nine with me just for a moment. We wanna look at a few verses of scripture that I think could be helpful. Starting in verse 12. He, Jesus, entered once for all into the holy places. What a dope verse for my Bible lovers in the room. Jesus entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood. Like Jesus steps into the holy place and they say, Lola, what type of blood you got? He goes, I got my blood. And they go, yes, sir. (laughs) That's the only blood that's needed in this case. Thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, this is old covenant language. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Oh my goodness. The blood of Jesus purifies our conscience so that when you make a wrong decision, when you fall into sin, when you go backwards instead of going forwards, when you do the very thing that you told God at the altar you would never do again, and your conscience says, Yeah, I guess you're just done. You should probably just give it all up and just leave the church, leave the faith, uh, leave Jesus. Um, He hates you. He's actually condemning you. You're actually gonna die and go to hell in the next five minutes. Like Your mind will play tricks on you, right? Can I tell you what speaks a better word than that? The blood. That the blood of Jesus starts to have the louder voice 
and become, begins the, the very thing to clean your conscience. How do you clear? How do you clean? How do you get a new sense of conscience and focus? Oh, friend, here's how. Remember the blood. Why do we need to do this? Oh, I need to remember this. Or else my mind plays tricks on me and it says, hi, you, gotta, you better worship harder. You better pray longer. You didn't read your Bible enough. All of a sudden, I'm back into the old covenant. I got to do more. I got to work harder more. And we're so tempted to enter into that. Friend, don't enter into that. Jesus died for that. Amen. He rose for that. Don't let this message become so familiar that you lose its wonder. I remember talking to a, a, a good friend of mine. He called me up. He's not necessarily a believer yet. But he said, hey, Pastor Hyden, I got to get to church. I made a wrong decision. So this time I'm going to come and I'm going to drop a $50 bill in the plate. And I was like, that's right, bro. You better. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> that would have been jacked up. I said, dude, that's not how this works. <laughs> Were you about to buy a blessing? You think that God's going to forgive you? You put a $50 bill in the plate? What? That's not, you don't earn it. The minute you start to deceive, your conscience starts to say you got to earn grace, you've lost the definition of grace. Grace, by definition, is something you can't earn. So it's an erroneous statement to say I got to earn it. It's a contradictory mindset to say I have to work hard enough. Listen to me. If a Mormon comes into your life and says, yeah, Jesus' blood plus what you do, don't buy it. Don't listen to it. We don't add anything to our salvation. We receive salvation. If a Jehovah's Witness pops up at your door and says, hey, I want to give you the truth, you're like, yo, if your truth has anything to do with me adding to the truth, it's not the truth. Tell them the truth. Say, I got, I got a greater, I got the true truth. It's found in the blood. And the blood will never lose its power, and the blood is not waiting for Hyden to do better. The blood was good before I was alive. The blood was pure, righteous, and holy, and enough to satisfy the wrath of God before me and you were even thought of. Jesus thought of you. The blood. May it never lose its power in your life. This word conscience, we're, we're getting a deeper knowledge. Let me break up the word conscience for a second. Uh, con, science. With knowledge, conscience. You're, you're helping your mind, your brain, your, your spirit, your soul, your conscience. Get, understand, grab a hold of the knowledge of the blood. How can a believer say, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ? Only by the blood. How can you stand before Satan on the day of eternity and the adversary begins to pick apart your life and tell you all the wrongdoings? All you have is the blood. All you have is the power of the blood. The blood moves our conscience. Let me give you the second point. The blood moves us to confidence. So as the blood begins to do this incredible transforming work in your life, so even though you're not perfect, the blood is perfect. Even though you have this dance where you miss it, you make a wrong mistake, you don't get it right, the blood is there to cleanse and purify. That leads us to confidence, doesn't it? That leads us to a greater confidence to do this thing, to walk this life out. How am I going to live this Christian life out? Listen, you live it by the blood. You walk by the Spirit. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, again, we're, we're reading a, a chunks of Scripture because I think the greatest word you need today is His word. Hebrews chapter 10 says it like this. Therefore, brothers, sisters in the room, since we have confidence, it's a big word, we have confidence to enter the holy places by the good works that we have. Nope. Just making sure we're all here. <laughs> Listen to me. Don't put your confidence in yourself. Don't put your confidence to enter the holy places off of your good deeds. They're not enough. Don't put your confidence in somebody else's good deeds. That's not how this works unless that somebody else is Christ. Don't put your confidence in your parents' good deeds. I've heard too many people over the years say, I'm a Christian because my parents are Christian. 
It's not how it works, family. At some point, you got to make your conscience decision to receive Jesus by acknowledging you're a sinner in need of a Savior. I mean, one of, my, one of the coolest things just happened recently. There was a baptism um, here at Walk Church a couple weeks ago. Somebody got baptized. Uh, the, the dad gave their kid a hug and said, I'm so grateful that you're not only my son, but my brother. It's like, whoa, that was deep. You got to make that decision for yourself. Every person in this room has to make that decision. That's why we don't baptize infants here at Walk Church, because I've never heard an infant articulate the gospel and know what they were talking about and understand that they're a sinner in desperate need of a savior. Anybody who can articulate sin as the thing that separates us from God and is then able to say, but the blood has saved me and it's no longer confidence in me or what I've done or what I can give or what I can do, but my confidence is in Christ. That's a good reason to get baptized. So I would even say today, if your baptism's out of order, where you got baptized before you recognized who Jesus is and what he's done for you, take that step of obedience. We would love to help you do it. So many people have done that at this church and it's powerful. He continues, he says, we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. Verse 20, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain. Now, what a profound statement that is. So again, if you look into the old covenant, you even go to the old holy sites, you'll find the temple. And the temple contained a few different spaces. You have the holy of holies, which is the holiest room in the temple that was built in the Holy of Holies. The high priest would go into the Holy of Holies one time out of the year. They would even tie a little bell to their leg in case they approached the room in an ungodly or unwise way and died right there on the spot. So if you heard the bell start jingling, they're like, oh, he dead. Pull him out. Don't get too close. The holiness was too intense. There was a curtain that was erected for that purpose to guard the space. And then there was a different space of worship. Then there was the outer courts of the temple and different people could go into different spaces. Can I tell you something? Jesus on the cross, shedding of his blood, tears down the curtain, opens it up. So now people like me and you are going in and our, and our badge, beep, it says the blood where it was only the the, whole, the, the high priest goes through the curtain. We don't go through the curtain. Oh, I'm not going through the curtain. Now we have a greater high priest. That's why Jesus carries the name great high priest. Not to devalue high priests, not to devalue the priesthood, uh, especially on the display in the old covenant, but to show that he's the great high priest. He's the pastor to the pastors. He's the leader of the leaders. He's the Lord of lords. He's the king of kings. Come on. That, that's Jesus in his supremacy, right? Jesus reigns supreme. His blood can do that, opens up the curtain for us, creates a way. That is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, oh, praise God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. When you approach the Lord's table today, if you believe in Jesus Christ, approach it with assurance. Approach it full of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This is gospel language, amen? This is good news for the believer here today that even our evil conscience that, ha- that haunts us and wishes we could have did better and you know what I need to do more. Third and final point is this. The blood moves us toward Christ. The blood, the blood moves our conscience The blood moves us to confidence. And really, we find these things in the person of Christ. The blood moves us toward Christ. The blood of Jesus, when we approach the table, moves us in such a way that we want to know him better. We want to know him more. We want to be found in him. Not in the confidence that is in ourselves, but in the confidence that's in him. I love this verse in the book of Ephesians chapter two, and worship team, help me close this message out. We're gonna go ahead and respond in a time of singing. 
But Paul writes to the Ephesian church and he says in verse 13, but now in Christ. Oh, can y'all help me read it? In fact, let's, let's read it together, but read it to the person you're sitting next to. Just go ahead. Even if you don't know him, just tell him this verse. Ready, set, go. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Oh, amen. Mm. Me and you, we were once far off. We were once far away. You were, we were. But we've been brought near. We've been brought near by the blood of Christ Jesus. So today I want to invite you to grab one of these packets. They're in the back, left, right, front, down. And I want you to uh, not rush. Don't be flippant. Don't be feeble. Get off Instagram. Don't worry about scores. Let's just take the next few minutes to do business with God. I would say to you today, if there's sin in your life that you have not confessed to the Lord, or if there's somebody that you don't have a right relationship right with and that you maybe have sinned against them or maybe they've sinned against you and you need to make that right, here's what I'll tell you. Put this in your backpack. <laughs> Put this in your purse and say, I'm gonna get to this later. I'm gonna hold off, but I'm gonna get to this, but I'm gonna go make something right. A brother after the 9 a.m. service goes, I got this, but I'm not ready. I gotta call my grandpa and then I'm gonna take this. Because I wanna make something right. Jesus died for that relationship. I wanna make it right. Can I just tell you today? There have been times where I've walked back to the 412 before preaching and said, you know what, I gotta make something right with my wife before I approach the Lord's table today. <laughs> where I've stepped outside, I've made a phone call, I've sent a text message, or I've just said, you know what, I'm not gonna partake today. In my journey of being a Jesus follower over the past several years, there's moments like that. But praise God, I don't do it to receive grace. I already have grace. I do it because I want to approach this communion packet. The blood has moved me with momentum to be more like Christ. So as you get more closer to Christ, you then feel a conviction to do things that he tells you to do. So I want to encourage you as you partake today, take it with a sensitivity and awareness. Take it with a celebration, amen? Look at Romans chapter 5 with me. Romans 5. Romans 5. We'll put it up on the screen. Since therefore we now have been justified by his blood. That should make everybody in the room shout. <laughs> Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Thank you for the blood. Let's pray. Father, thank you for meeting us here today. Thank you for leading us today. And God, we acknowledge that we need you. And I would even say if there's anybody in this room right this moment who hasn't received Jesus as the Lord and the Savior of his or her life, this is your moment to do so. You don't need to come down to get communion. You need to come to Christ by faith. I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. It's not the words of this prayer, but it's more of your faith in Christ that I want to lead you to step toward. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm ready. I'm ready to receive you. I receive your death for my sins. I receive your resurrection from the grave. I confess that I'm a sinner, but I'm no longer the same. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Cleanse me with your Holy Blood for all my days. I receive you by faith. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.